Professor Glenn Perry, thank you so much for being on the show today. Would you, for the benefit of the listeners, please give a brief overview of your research interests and how you got to where you are today? Gosh, um, how long do you want? Uh, so <laughs> I suppose like a lot of researchers, I, I have a, quite a, an increasingly broad range of interests. But fundamentally, at the moment, my work is being focused on applications of blockchain for the benefit of supply chain. Um, I've really for, tried to focus on, I, I tend to take an operations management or a supply chain view of the world. I'm really interested in value, what value means. Uh, and some of my work then sort of spans over into well, what is value and gets quite philosophical, asking uh, when we look at value, is it is it somehow a measure of what is good? And then what does good actually mean and the different ways that that value can be perceived, everything from money to social good, uh, all, all those sort of constructs I explore. Okay, so that's really interesting. From whose perception are you referring to in terms of what is good for whom? Well, good for whom is a very good good question to ask, um, and it is. It's well, we just published a recent paper where we looked at different perceptions of good and actually from a consumer, a, a data intermediary and a, a provider firm, uh, they're different perceptions of the value of data. And, you know, who's it good for it? Actually, from an ontological and epistemological perspective, their perceptions differ. And that we thought was important to note if you're running a firm and you're you know, maybe using data, the way somebody interprets the value of that data can be fundamentally very different. So you might see it as a source of value. They might see it as uh, something that enables them to access uh, or, or it might be access to service or you know, some form of trade, but it could also be something that they perceive as inherently valuable inherently good for social benefit. Uh, other people just see it as money and they're very different constructs. Now, this is interesting because when you're talking about data and value, I just think of somebody swiping on their phone and seeing a cookies notice and debating whether or not to accept or to just get to the website. Is this sort of in line with, with the things you're talking about, how we share our personal data? Yeah, but personal personal data is is quite a broad remit. I mean, we've we've got another paper looking at healthcare, mm. um, and people think their health data is their most sensitive because that that's all about you. Uh, there's an awful lot of, of information within healthcare data, um, and there's this this fairly well known sort of paradox where people say, you know, oh, it's my most sensitive data. I'll, I'll never give it away, and then they very readily give it away. Um, it's, it's this sensitivity around, well, if I share it, maybe, you know, this, this idea of benevolence, where if I share it, it might be helpful for other people, it might lead to cures. Uh, so that will help me. Um, likewise, it might be naivety, that they don't realise, you know, I'll share this with my doctor, but actually I didn't read all the terms and conditions, and I've just given my healthcare away, data away to all these firms. Um, Okay. Okay. So what, based on the paper that you just put out then, what, what is the future of this? Where do we go from here, from your findings? Um, when we're seeking, I, I mean, I, 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 I take quite a, uh, I try and take the sort of ethics and moral, the good viewpoint of it. So how can we achieve social good with these things? Um, truly informed consent is slightly more difficult to get. So if you want truly informed consent, you've got to explain quite a lot. You've got to be really quite transparent and you've got to do it in a way that people will engage. So, so that... attention span the issue then? I mean, what's the barrier to being able to just sort of hurl that at people so that they can, you know, have informed consent? Yeah, I mean, you, you raise a good point there. Attention span and willingness to engage in detail. Um, it's something uh, I was working on a, a project a few years ago, a big uh, military uh, defense project where we were moving product from product to service. We were studying how they were moving product to service. And it's quite complicated. 
the way the way things change. Uh, and what one of the managers said was that the problem they face is a lot of people now only understand things on the level of PowerPoint. Mm, interesting. And I thought, yeah, that's the that's not good enough. I mean, she said, uh, yeah, people, we used to send people reports and they'd read reports and then they come to the meeting and we'd discuss. Now it's a PowerPoint presentation in the meeting. Mm-hmm. And so this this deeper level understanding is often missing. So if we can go back to one of the first things you said then, how does this all relate to value? Getting, you know, this data, does it matter that people are conformed what it, or informed? What is the value then of where this all goes? Well, does it matter if people know? <laughs> uh, I think it does. Um, but I, I, I'm, I always look at the, at the sort of the ethics, the morals and the values that people have and what they espouse. And, and how we can sort of close the gap between what people would like to do and what they actually do. Because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. um, we look at, at value of data and, and where we've got to, where we've, we've got these very large firms that are holding lots of data, you know, the, the classic Facebook, Apple, Microsoft, Google. Um, and the value of that data is held now in, in a vanishingly small number of people's pockets. Mm-hmm. And a, a colleague of mine recently said that, in, you know, the, the trickle down economics model is no good because it's, it's barely trickling. And is a trickle really what we want? And so she's working on this, this self-sovereign data idea where, you know, if the individual hold their data, then let value trickle up, but you hold, you hold the value yourself, and that's a a nicer model. If if the individual holds their personal data with this self sovereign data idea, uh, then yeah, the, maybe they'll realise the value of it. But it also overcomes a lot of the the issues around uh, GDPR, uh, you know, all the personal data uh, issues, where instead of is in, instead of um, a large firm holding all your data and running algorithms on it, if you hold all your data and with permission allow them to send you algorithms and analyze your data and just send metadata out, then yeah, they can explain, look, I'm sending you this algorithm. This is what this algorithm does. I think that's maybe better informed. It's a data Swift is, is, is the firm, um, which originally was how we were part of starting that many years ago but it's now it's now grown and i'm not really not really engaged so much with it but i think the the idea is really interesting that you flip the model effectively now controversial question as it relates to to value and all these things the more powerful companies get the more powerful data gets that the companies hold where is the responsibility or is there a responsibility to cultivate trust with the consumer? Is it, responsibility is interesting as a construct. Um, so trust, I mean, blockchain we've spoken about. People say, oh, blockchain you know, uh, provides trust. Um, that's something we argue with in our research on when we're looking at blockchain because trust is a relationship. Trust is a relationship between parties. And so technology can only help that relationship develop, but your actions can destroy that relationship. And instantly. Exactly, yeah. And we see that, you know, with with individuals' behaviors can take a firm down. Mm -hmm. You no longer trust them. And so trust is something to be managed carefully. And it's hugely important because the moment you no longer trust, you start to withdraw from that firm. Um, though, again, people's actions, you know, again, thinking more recently about the, the whole Facebook data analytica scandal. Um, yeah, they were caught mining data and selling it and what have we. Um, yeah, how many, though, how many young people are on Facebook these days? I think uh, <laughs> vanishingly few just to, you people like me, maybe in this barren wasteland. <laughs> yeah, they've all gone to uh, 
much less functional platforms. <laughs> <laughs> much shinier objects, yes. Shinier objects, less functionality. But it's, uh, yeah, trust is hugely important. And, you know, that's one of the things that blockchain is supposedly uh, able to facilitate. It doesn't replace it. It just helps you establish and build trust. Now, this work is relevant, timely, and important, as the, you know, boring management experts may say. The Future of Work Research Center tries to coordinate, connect, and or create. Of those three, which does your work most embody, or is it more than one? Um, I think when I, I look at some of the, when we're looking at the blockchain supply chain things, mm -hmm. uh, you've got coordination um, and what's it trying to achieve? I mean, blockchain, for those who, who, who maybe don't really know, uh, it's, it's, it's the technology that underpins cryptocurrencies. Okay. Um, blockchain is actually the particular form of distributed ledger technology that underpins Bitcoin. But it's just the word became, you know, generally used, like vacuum cleaner became Hoover. <laughs> okay. Where's the Hoover? You actually mean Hoover's a brand. You can be whereas vacuum cleaner is the whole, it's like blockchain is a particular one. That actually it became the, the the name that we use for all the different forms of, of distributed ledger technologies. Um, so let's persist with using the term blockchain incorrectly. Um, but all it really is, is a list that's difficult to change. It creates a digital list mm -hmm. in a particular way that's very hard to change. And you share it a bunch of, amongst a, a whole number of different people. So when is that useful to be able to write a list of things that's difficult to change? Well, if you're building an aircraft and you're putting parts on it and there's a problem with the aircraft, it's really useful for everybody to be able to go back to the list of all the parts that you said was on it and nobody can change it. <laughs> you go back and go, oh, right. Mm. Yeah, so it's probably this one that's a problem or that's when it's useful. So, you know, food any transaction i gave you this much money no you didn't yes i did look we both agreed at this point in time and we both signed that this transaction took place and that's why sometimes it's called a truth engine oh i haven't yeah. heard that one that's that's fun yeah also massively misleading um because again it's just a list of things that's difficult to change it's not necessarily the truth uh Unfortunately, as, as one of our interviewees once said, blockchain comes with a halo of truth because people think, oh, it's on the blockchain. It must be true. We're like, no, it's only as good as whatever you put in it. So when we look at agriculture, for instance, you might put in how big your field is, what the weather was like, what you put on those crops, hopefully nothing, you know, if it's organic. Uh, and then you yield, but that's all, all maybe a farmer in a field inputting this data into the system that's then hashed and put on the block, you know, hashed, stored securely against the blockchain. Um, that data input might be a lie. Point is, um, what a blockchain does isn't provide truth. What it does is provide liability. And I think that's a better description of it because it says, this is what I hold to be true. At this point in time, I said that. So people can hold you liable. Now, if we start viewing it like that, that's actually quite powerful. It is powerful. And we're having these conversations in the wider industry, aren't we, as it relates to AI and chat GPT and just machine learning as a whole, the dictionary, the knowledge base is only what you tell it. It can't make certain inferences. It can't pull from a platform that didn't exist already. So powerful. Yeah. So that's where it's it's useful. It, it holds you accountable for what you said at a point in time, mm -hmm. or at least liable for that. You said this at this point. Um, so, you know, 
we look at Twitter and what some people said at certain points in time. <laughs> quite quite how useful is this? Maybe I'll revise that thinking. <laughs> right. um, but yeah, that's that's what it's what it can do, and that's therefore quite useful. Um, so when we look at at the sort of applications we've studied, so looking at grain, looking at you know organic status of grain. Mm -hmm. So you said you grew this much, and then we we can see we should see a fall in 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 yield as it's processed. So every time you process it, you expect that quantity of grain to drop a little bit. So you you know you you get so many tons on your truck, and then you might extract something from it, and then you end up with a certain amount that's actually usable that you may turn into I don't know corn flakes or whatever, mm -hmm. and then you, you can then say that's organic because I had a ton of it, and now you know if I have a ton of grain that makes however much of of my processed corn flakes, and we can we can see that 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 balance is out. And that no more has been added into the system. Okay, interesting. So it does sound like a little bit of coordinating, connecting, and creating all together, like all at once, because of the sort of, um, <clears throat> you know, intricacy of the system. If if I'm picking that up correctly. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, blockchain's that classic. You know, it, it's a squirrel. Uh, <laughs> You know, a squirrel is just a rat with a bushy tail, and everyone's like, "Oh, squirrel!" Whereas, ah, rat. Uh, nobody cares about rats. But blockchain's just a way of storing data, and it's it's more or less useful depending on where it is in the system. But for some reason, it sort of blew up as an idea, um. So it's mostly not useful because you can do most of the things you want to do with a centralized database which is cheaper faster you don't have the governance issues you don't have the, the complexity that you bring in when you try and distribute the data amongst a number of people and get them to mine it and secure it it's complicated um so when is it useful in in a, a fairly small number of cases yeah it's useful but no, most as... of... oh, sorry what was that I said, well, some of the time it's useful, but most of the time, no. Um, and that's, again, people are increasingly learning. Oh, yeah, actually, why would we use it here? But it does have this small number of very powerful use cases. Now, as somebody who prefers squirrels to rats, yeah, and as someone who used to hear the term blockchain and sort of have like, the eyes glaze over and it go over my head. I appreciate the way you broke that down to sort of the lay listener. So thank you for that explanation. It's far more fascinating than I initially thought. Again, I will confess. Um, to this end, because it's far more interesting than I imagined, can you tell us about your most fascinating project to date? Gosh, I mean, you know, as a researcher, the last paper you wrote is the most fascinating and then the next one I'm about to write is the most fascinating and those ideas and um, but some of the things uh you know I really got got fascinated interested in blockchain um when I met uh this guy uh Trent McConaughey at Digital Catapult in London and this was years ago this is before NFTs was a thing and he got this this uh, project he was working on, um, looking at provenance of digital art. And his wife, Masha, and him and a couple of others were developing this blockchain project, which was fascinating because the market back then for digital art was very small. And the projections for growth seemed large at the time. And I was like, surely digital art won't grow that big. Um, and, you know, they were massively under what the market became at peak. Um, but, yeah, they built this, this blockchain provenance system where you registered your art and then it, it showed who you sold it to. So, I mean, the problem with digital art is anyone can have a copy. 
Um, so but who's got the original? And then you've got this sort of, well, is there such a thing as an original when copies look identical? Well, you could say, yeah, that's right. But then there is something about the, you know, who owns the original, who's who's notionally the custodian. And that's that's what it did. And I was really fascinated by their work. They were way ahead of their time. I mean, it really genius level insight these these guys had had got and they developed this great system and uh, built their own blockchain uh, system so that you know you registered it and you could exchange it and it was very clever and that i was really fascinated by that and unfortunately they, they were so far ahead of their time uh that the whole project didn't work uh, nfts eventually came along and it all blew up but they'd moved on by then um but yeah, that that really got me. I was like, yeah, I can see why this is useful because you're you've got this asset, notionally a digital picture, and you can trade it, and then you can use things like you know reverse image lookup, where you can scan the web and say you've got my picture, and you're not paying me any, you know, rents or or whatever. Or you could send them an email saying, look, you're using my image, you owe me money, or you're using my image. Can you just write this image belongs to underneath it, or you're using my image. I acknowledge that. That's fine. You can you can do as you like. Um, but yeah, that that was fascinating, and that really hooked me in their insight into what blockchain could do, and blockchain just be part of a system for provenance of digital art. That was um, what was their system called? A scribe uh, that they created. But yeah, it's all part of the system. So that fascinated me. We were working. You know, I, I spoke earlier about data swift and the self sovereign data. I was asked, is is blockchain useful in that space? When we trade our data, is, is it w worth tokenizing it? Actually, we spent a lot of time looking at that and decided it wasn't really at the time useful to, to have a blockchain sitting in the middle of this self-sovereign data system. Maybe at some point in the future, we might think so, but actually that's why I'm always, it's useful in some places. We didn't see a role for it at the time and still don't in that particular space maybe something will emerge so we're always open for that and then other things uh, came through so we uh we looked at a number of food supply uh, organizations and that's quite useful tracking food through the supply chain so uh, fish and grain and baby food and wine so we, we wrote a little paper uh, I wrote that with Mike Rogerson, who's now at, at Sussex. But we did this paper looking at different, you know, applications of blockchain where it was being used to provide provenance for uh, foods. Um, and that's those firms we worked with were great. And uh, some of the insights that came out, we could see that if if you've got, you know, tons and tons of grain, it's it's quite useful. Um, because that's quite a lot of money and, and the cost is, is a fraction. Uh, fish, uh, when you're looking, it's transeable. Uh, World Wildlife Fund tracking fish in the uh, Pacific, um, where it's caught, how sustainable it is, all those sort of things you can capture. This is the catch. This is where it is. That sort of system is, is great. But again, the weaknesses that we saw that came through was always the physical digital interface. Mm -hmm. So if you've got a physical object like fish or grain or wine, how do you link it to the digital world? And it's it's the interface and all, pretty much all the case studies said that's the problem. You've still got to trust the people inputting the data. Mm -hmm. And if you've got a tray full of fish, how do you link it? Well, you put a barcode on the side of the tray. What's actually linked? It's not the fish. It's the little paper square that's on the side of a plastic container. Um, if it's the grain, it's probably the container that it's in that's actually linked. So it's you've linked to a label, not to the contents. So there are so this is terrifying in a way. There are so many multiple layers where you just need to trust or you choose to trust 
Yeah. Well, TechRock, who did the baby food, what they'd done was it was in China and there'd been a baby food scandal where they'd got all sorts of unpleasant things put into baby food and then sold it cheaply. They took the tin and they put a RFID tag over the top. So if you tried to open it, it broke the tag. And then there's a little QR code on the top. So the consumer could scan the QR code and it will show this is what this tin should be. And obviously the RFID tag could be uh, traced and it would show you who's handled it and where. So you've got real insight into where has that tin been and who's touched it. Uh, that's great. But as they said, you know, it's really good. The limit with it it's the cost of that means it's got to be on products that can sustain that margin. So baby food, people will pay to know that, say, wine, similar systems we saw in wine, uh, where, you know, but wine's got a, quite a nice margin on it. If you're looking at very cheap products, not so much. Um, so we then looked at chocolate. And chocolate's horrendous. I, I'm sure a lot of the people uh, who listen to this like a bit of chocolate, maybe. I understand it's a popular food product. <laughs> Indeed. Um, but it's, I mean, it's appalling. The the slavery, uh, just, just hideous things that happen in that supply chain with modern slavery, with environmental damage. It's, you know, mostly horrendous. Um, some of the big brands, uh, if you look at so last year or the year before, when they found uh, was it five chaps, I'm trying to remember the detail, I'm sure people listening to this can look it up, but Nestle fought a court case in America uh, where I think it was five guys were trafficked. Oh, I'm going to get the detail wrong, I should have checked this. I think it was Malawi they were in and they were trafficked up to Ivory Coast or something like that, and they you know, forced to work on cocoa farms that weren't owned by Nestle, but were uh, providing cocoa beans to them via their supply chain. So they sued Nestle uh, for, uh, you know, their, their time as being modern in modern slavery. Nestle fought it and won. And I think the judge in the States ruled, it was a very strange ruling. I'm trying to remember what it said exactly, but it was something along the lines of this was, you know, extra uh you know extraterrestrial outside of the american system and and also deemed that this was normal practice in the region and therefore and you're like i don't think the judge was particularly happy with things but legally this was where it was this was outside the firm shouldn't should that firm know that that's in the supply chain absolutely is is there a problem with chocolate? Well, we looked into it. And back in 18, whatever it was, 1890s, 100 years ago, Cadbury's, a big British brand, um, saw that there was modern slavery. Because obviously they were Quakers, Rangtrees, Terriers of York, and Cadbury's were Quakers. And they were chocolate producers, confectioners. And there was reports here by, I can't remember the chap's name, got one of the, got a book behind me somewhere. Uh, okay, Nevinson's book. I don't know if you can pick that up. Modern Slavery. Yep. Yeah, by Henry Watt. Is it Henry Webb? Uh, Henry Wood Nevinson. Wood Nevinson, okay. Um. But what they were seeing was, um, you know, modern slavery where people were were being forced to work. And back then, um, I think this came out in Punch that there was slavery in the chocolate supply chain. And so Cadbury and, you know, the, the Quakers in, in the Midlands were like, mm, this isn't good. Then their man over there to uh, you know the ivory coast principe sayo tome i'm probably murdering the way you pronounce those countries uh, those those islands um but yes send 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 their man over there to have a look and 
you know, the letters originally came back going, no, all's well, but he was being minded, but he was there a while. And eventually he started to see, oh my God, this is, this is horrendous the way people are being treated and the way this, this cocoa's um, being farmed and you know, child labor and slavery and all this sort of stuff. Um, so the letters came back and it was, you know, boycott cocoa from these regions. He went over to America to do this, say the same thing. And so this, you know, horrendous uh, modern slavery was being seen. Um, this is a hundred years ago. And it hasn't changed. So it's it's like, should we give chocolate companies a pass? Absolutely not. They've had a hundred years to sort this out. It's still going on. Yes, you can say there's problems in, in North Africa. These are vast regions where tracing the supply chain is really difficult because you know you you you, you follow the cocoa back. And it's lots and lots and lots of very small farms spread over vast regions because Africa is very, very large and borders are very difficult. And you just can't get to these places. Uh, and the coca comes via, you know, people on mopeds and whatever through forest tracks to regional little hubs where it's then sent down to more hubs. And finally, it, it makes its way into the supply chain. There's issues around poverty where people you know, kids working on these farms because it's supporting them. All sorts of issues around tracing that supply, very hard. Um, so we actually did a project um, where we, we found somebody who'd been looking at DNA. And going back to that um, challenge of, you know, the label on the box, what we got was this DNA fingerprint, where if you DNA tag the tree, Weirdly, the cocoa bean picks that up. And even after all the processing, the DNA fingerprint can be picked up in a chocolate bar. So the, you know, the, the chocolate from the tree and say Ghana or whatever that's been tagged, you can pick that up from your kit can reading, even though it's it's gone through this massive amount of processing. So the solutions are there. If you want to use them. But then you've got the, oh, well, it might put five pence on the cost of a bar of chocolate. Uh, so, you know, we can put that on a blockchain so that the trees are tagged. We know exactly where it's from. You can trace it. Makes it difficult because you, you've still got to go and walk around in these places, find the trees. It's, it's difficult. You might have to, I don't know, alleviate some poverty in Africa. And uh, maybe build a few schools. But we, we've had a hundred years to sort this out. Now, uh, is consumer vigilance making a difference at all in the age of social media and information at the ready at your fingertips? Do you consumers care? Hmm. I guess that's uh, the question. Yeah, I mean, I know I, I shared a paper with you recently with a very risque title. <laughs> very good sociological content yes but yeah um which you might you maybe you can put an image of that paper on the screen for people to consider it's about <laughs> what nuance can do <laughs> uh and this talking about you know theory being nuanced and i i, I think here if we look at the nuance that's always put on it oh do consumers care if you're buying a T-shirt for three pounds in a supermarket, you know, if you're buying a five dollar T-shirt, someone somewhere is getting screwed. <laughs> Where's that? You know, if you're if you're you know, there's we know there's issues in cotton, uh, in milling, in garment production. We know there's issues in wood, in cocoa. We know there's, you know, major issues that are grinding poverty. Uh, and you know, oppression and slavery and all these supply chains. Do people care? Um, when the rubber hits the road and they're at the till at the store, do they care? Yeah. And it's like, oh, well, I don't know. Mm. Okay. It's, it's a worrying question to ask. I mean, I really hope one-to-one -one everybody cares. 
But then when it's like, oh, I just have a cheeky bar of chocolate, you know, up, up chocolate. Uh, or, you know, Tony's Chocoloni, I haven't managed to get access to their supply chain. We've tried, mm. but their branding suggests they're trying. They they charge a premium for that bar. So, yeah, but then you've got chocolate at £2.50, £3 a bar, maybe. And, oh, but, you know, 85p is very a compelling price point. So... What are you prepared to pay for? Where's what does good mean? Oh. Where, is, where is value here? Yes, and I see, but that by asking that question, I unearthed more questions instead of an answer. Something for everyone, the listeners and beyond, to reflect on, really. Yeah. Um, because you're right, one to one, sure, but it's the private purchasing behavior, isn't it? That that's really going to tell the story. Yeah, look in your cupboard. Would you honestly admit what's in there? <laughs> yeah, you know, those chocolate bars, how ethically sourced are they? Mm -hmm. That T-shirt you bought, oh, yeah, but it was cheap on holiday. Mmm, great. It's, Food for thought for everyone to consider, really. Yeah, I mean, it's and it's difficult. Um, though, I, I, I'm, I'm a horrendous consumer. You know, I've always been, oh, I am spending money, clothes, shoes. Um, but like last last year, I well, for the last few years, actually, I've been trying to buy ethically. It's really hard. Um, and it's really expensive. So, you know, I wanted a new jumper. So I was like, how do I, how do I ethically source a jumper so that I'm not buying one that I don't know where the stuff's come from? So I ended up getting a Guernsey jumper, which was, you know, wool from Guernsey, knitted on the island by people who live there. So I'm hoping that's pretty good. Channel Island Jumper Company, it's very nice. And I like it. Um, but it was a lot of money. I'm like, hmm, you know, this is terribly middle class to be ethical. Why, why is that a choice? So it's, yes, it's not always down to choice. It's down to, especially in this day and age, cost of living and that it's, it's what people can do, not just what they want to do. It's yeah. the extent of what their resources allow. No, there's, there's definitely something around consumerism. Um, my, I have a new year's resolution. I had two this year. Oh. oh yeah. Yeah. One was to read some books because, you know, despite you know, I'm an academic, so people assume, oh, you must be terribly well. I'm not well read at all. God, I have to read for a living. I don't read anything. I used to be able to list pretty much every reading book that I'd ever read. People go, oh, you must have read Dante or you must have read Shakespeare. I've not read a damn thing. Um, so I was like, right, I will read more books this year. So a book a month and, and a friend of mine challenged me and we keep tags on each other. Have you I've been reading? I mean, don't get me wrong, I've been reading Dick Francis novels, which are about horse racing. Um, and here's the other one about Jack Reacher, I'm trying to remember his name. Lee Child. Lee Child, yeah, you know, this is not high level intellectual engagement, but I've been reading a book a month. But the other, the other New Year's resolution I made was I wouldn't buy any clothes. Can I go a whole year without buying? And that was really interesting for the first few months because you wander around. I've got kids, you know, you wander around stores and you see all these deals. You think, oh, I'll just buy it. I'll just I'm like, so I stopped. And it, it's been quite interesting. Like, just can you go a whole year without buying any clothes? At some point, everything, you know, bits are going to wear out. But actually, yeah. And going forward, I'm going to see how long I can go. Yeah, I'll, I'll end up replacing some bits, but wearing stuff out, giving stuff away, I'll probably end up with a small enough amount of stuff, but I'm going to buy better. I'm, you know, for those who know me now, I do have a particular issue with shoes. I have a lot of shoes. Um, but again, you know, starting to look, you know, what shoes do you buy? buy something that's not made overseas, buy something, you know, in the UK, we've got Northampton, incredible 
shoemakers and yeah they're expensive but you buy one pair and it'll last you such a long time you know Lokes, Crockett and Jones, Trickers, Churches, Cheney and Sons uh, and then if you've got loads of money you can buy some John Lobs from London but you know incredible brands that are in that area and you can look up all the different handmade ones and there, there are others you know great homemade things with really lovely quality why not buy those shoes particularly because you wear them every day um, and and engage in in that yeah okay it's maybe privilege of having a bit again middle class privilege but as a kid everybody had one pair of shoes and now how many pairs do you actually have and how many do you actually need yeah yeah that's yeah that's narrow down how many you have instead of having 12 pairs why one good one interesting now i'm going to go through my closet after this conversation um and my shoe rack so <laughs> in terms of all of this consumer behavior blockchain trust value the the different directions that we've been talking about i'm i'm curious if you were to act as an advisor or consultant to organizations, and I know you have acted as one to many, what what's the next one you might like to approach? What would be a really fascinating consultant relationship for you? Ooh. Um, I'm, I suppose there's two things I'm really interested in. One is, is seeing you know, what am I actively doing? Seeing applications of blockchain, we're looking at the border, at the UK border, and, and how how can we help goods flow? Because, uh, you know, we are in a global supply chain. And if we can, if, like, data as a supply chain, data is only really valuable if it flows. If you're just sitting on it, there's no value. It's just a liability, really. You're paying to store something. So stuff needs to flow. I, I am, despite all the... The rhetoric i'm really into you know trade open markets i think that's where you see wealth being shared you know why is venice uh as it is because it was a, a massive trading hub uh, so and you get this this richness where you know cultures intermingle and you know people share experiences and where you know increasingly people talk about globalization is it really globalization? Where's the intermingling? You know, let's let's open that up. I think that's where you meet people from different cultures. You understand their views of the world. That you know, to take Gadamian view, their prejudices, their their prejudgments of how things are, and you 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 have yours. But when they're exchanged, you you broaden your horizons and you understand the world through other people's eyes. And that's where, to be honest, the world becomes a better place. Um, so you get this really open trade and looking at UK, you know, I'm absolutely not a fan of Brexit, um, but if we do get hold of our borders and we're, you know, that's a great, probably the most important bit of legislation that's ever happened is, you know, the uh, Electronic uh, Borders Act that's going through electronic um, trade. It, it, basically what it does is um, Electronic Digital Trade Act recognises the legitimacy of a digital um, representation of a physical good so that you can, because it used to be, you know, when a container comes in, there's a lot of physical paperwork uh, and that has to go with it's posted. And what we, what we can do is say, no, actually, if you hold the digital document, that means you own that. And, and you can transfer that. And there, there's all these, these it's, it's an interesting act where they say, well, you must be able to swap the digital to the physical and the physical to the digital. So those things must must be able to be exchanged. Um, but they link back to the asset, the product, whatever it is that's being shipped. Looking at the UK borders, if you can get uh, goods flowing through, so the, the digital supply chain matches the physical, uh, and then that's where blockchain is useful. You know, this bottle of wine started in Australia. It was handed to this shipper who handed it and put it on this ship. Then it spent this much time on this ship. And here's the data. 
and then it you know these intermediaries had it and now here it is it's sitting in this supermarket and one click you can see the entire supply chain you can, and you can check it on the bottle using some hidden technology you know speckle pattern or rfid or whatever you can get full visibility and then maybe somebody you know in another country somebody's tried to clone that bottle but they click on it and it goes oh no that that bottle's actually in the uk in, on a supermarket shelf you don't have it whatever you've got who knows so then you can throw up you know that's where blockchain systems it's not just a blockchain you combine it um allowing free flow of trade at borders that that's pretty exciting and that's you know we're, we're doing some work there so we can open up those borders using digital technology uh, and you know the government can then get a view straight in uh, uh, mainly for taxation and control and um, to make sure nothing illegal is flowing and then you can you know hopefully we can develop ai systems because really you're looking for strange strange quirks in patterns so you've got what we call trusted traders so they can bring their goods straight across you don't need to stop them at the port that lorry can keep moving and but then when strange things happen hopefully the technology will pick up that's a bit weird what happened there just stop it and then with the blockchain you can go right you declared all these things let's have a look at what you've got well, those things are different now you're in trouble because you're liable that's really exciting because hopefully that reopens up the uk uh, and if you can get a system to work here and demonstrate it hopefully other countries will then either take it on adopt or do something similar develop their own that's on the same as long as we can get integration and you know if you can do it on goods and services then people then hopefully you can then move to real nice flows the issue people's always the hard point when we were looking at um <clears throat> mind spider which is a really great firm um they've been looking at at, at um tin supply is, is probably the most interesting how uh, tracing tin from peru all the way through you know through the supply chain um the the, the difficulty is always people because you can tag products tagging people not allowed so you're still going to need audit to look at the people and getting people moving across the board is quite quite hard because do we want to go to facial recognition where your yeah. face data is captured somewhere you know we need some form of zero knowledge proof where they don't have the data but maybe they have some metadata that you know some trusted system where i hold the data but you get enough to know that i am me so those sort of reflexive systems on borders it gets quite tricky and that's where there's some you know great research going on but if we can get you know really open borders and flow and then maybe we could get back to global trade and um, that's safe and secure and good in every aspect of what we mean by that that's pretty exciting i think that get... is that is again timely relevant exciting mm. so that does sound good um difficult though eh? but... <laughs> well you know We'll get there, or we won't. I guess. Yeah, yes. <laughs> that was um, so true. That could that could be a great epitaph. We'll get there, or we won't. Yeah. <laughs> Probably don't yes. want to work in marketing for an airline. <laughs> <laughs> I, I always did consider myself a bit of a philosopher in that respect. Um, now to pivot like one hundred and eighty degrees, uh, I am wondering if you would be ready, willing, and able to recommend one book one scholar and one movie that might be relevant or interesting to your work could you recommend that um okay let's hmm. academic book or normal reading book we can do normal reading book or academic book see see how well i use the words <laughs> That's the only way I'm going to refer to it from now on. A reading book yes. and not the some description. Um, so Laura Shepard Robinson's been writing some great books. Um, 
her latest one, Square of Sevens, is, is really, I really enjoyed reading that. Um, Daughters of Night before that. But the, the one, the first one she wrote, Blood and Sugar, was about the Middle Passage, which was the uh, about the slave trade way, you know, goods would be sent to North Africa, traded for people. People would be traded from North Africa across to, you know, the Caribbean, whatever islands. And then sugar and things would be brought back up to the UK. So you got this middle passage where people were trafficked. And it sort of deals, it's a it's a really great read. It she's she she sort of wraps history and London and skullduggery and crime fiction uh linked to in her in that particular case something that should have really happened turner even painted a, a picture i think was the book there was a boat called the zang I'm trying to remember the name of the boat he painted it sinking but it was sort of hushed up at the time but that's that's a good read because it, it sort of brings in some of the stuff we talked about and it's a you know a, a normal everyday book not too academic um as an academic book gosh there's so many good ones i like and I've got a few up here. Um, sound awful if I say read Gadama's Philosophical Hermeneutics because it's terribly. Yeah, it's like mm, you should read Philosophical Hermeneutics. Great read, but the title's off putting, isn't it? Um, George Moore's Principle Ethica, Frank Kenner's book on ethics, moral ethics, really nice. Prime, and there's some bits in there which are outrageous when you read it. You go, Did you really write that? Um, but they're nice go-tos. Um, th those books on, you know, morals and ethics. Otherwise, you know, I talk about favourite papers. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, books, those ones, films. Oh, you know, I watch a lot of films. Um, now, High Fidelity, the book, um, was made into a film. But in that, they... They they always argued. Well, part of the, the the thing of that story was they argued about you know top X number of top ten, top five. So I have a top five favorite films. So could I pick one? No, because I I watch loads of films. But my five favorite films would be Casablanca, which is just glorious from start to finish. Love Humphrey Bogart. Uh, the Big Blue by Luc Besson. I think it's his best work. It's about how men are obsessive and it's beautifully shot it's about free diving which is just how far can you swim to take down great film El la hen uh which is a french film shot in black and white uh just it that's a that's a film about how the tension builds over time with with three central characters and and how the you know the police put pressure on them and eventually things explode really great film and brazil by terry gilliam it's a it's part of his trilogy of, of Time Bandits, which is young, youth, Brazil, which is middle age, and Baron von Munchausen, which is old age. Gilliam really distills what what um, 1984 should should have been. You know this this dystopian future, and um, it's it's I think it's a work of genius. Um, and the last one is uh, La Notte di Caberia, the Night of Caberia, which is Fellini. Um, it's just beautiful. It's sort of about it's about hope, but it's 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 a you know it's a Italian harrowing evening of this 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 woman, but it it's um yeah it's it's a beautiful Fellini film, which yeah it's, it's not the easiest of watches, but it's it's lovely. You go watch a little of Dolce Vita as well, but yeah, those are my top five. You know, honourable nod to the before sunrise, before sunset, before midnight that series and. and you know, that makes me sound really, oh, look at him liking all I love the Fast and the Furious. <laughs> <laughs> well, and Lord knows there are enough of those films that people can check them out and find their top five favorites just within that series. So, yeah. But if you say anything above seven, you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make I'll make official note of that and put it forward to the committee for adoption. Yeah, they, they, the first you were very good. <laughs> and a scholar? A scholar? Gosh. Um, a scholar I know? 
Um, because I liked Steve Vargas work on service dominant logic. And yeah. I still, um, really interesting way, Steve Vargo, uh, Bob Lush, you know, I met them, I was on a panel with them, which was great. There was, you know, Professor Irene and me, Professor Steve Vargo and Bob Lush, and I was sitting on this panel thinking, oh, I am so far out of my depth. But yeah, the way he's changed the way you can view what value means, you know, it's it's about service dominant logic and how what's valuable isn't the thing themselves, but the service that we get. It pretty much comes from, um, you know, it, it's an amalgamation of other work and ideas. So, you know, you, you've got to read up on your Adam Smith. Edith Penrose's book, The Theory of the Growth of the Firm, it was in a footnote when she wrote, you know, it, it's not the resources, it's the services that the resources render. I think it's around it's page 14, page 24. It's just like a little footnote where really, I mean, the insight she puts into that book, um, really great book, where you understand why firms grow. Um, I think that's, that's, you know, when we look at what is the things that we want, what's the true value? We're not actually interested in the object. We're interested in, in what that does for us. So when I talk about, you know, when I'm teaching service dominant logic, I say things like, um, I don't know how old you are, but I want to ask, did you, did you ever have an answer phone with the an tapes? An answer phone. Oh, like, like if somebody were leaving a message, like in, in America, we'd call it an answering machine. Answering yeah. machine. Do you ever have an answering machine? So yeah, okay. So I, I know some of the people watching this will go, what's an answering machine? But back in the day, you used to have a tape deck where somebody would phone and it would record their message on a tape. And then at a point in time, that became digital. And a whole industry of people who used to buy, who used to manufacture and sell answering machines disappeared. And nobody cared because what you want is the service of being able to access your messages to have them saved and you know that that whole industry was just lost so when people talk about oh brand loyalty i don't believe them because if something better comes along that maybe destroys an industry like it's why you know digital transformation that whole industry went why because the physical product became digital and we were never interested in the physicality of it we were interested in the services that the resource rendered which is you know pendrose and then came into the service dominant logic which was which was steve vargo's thinking and so we, if we look at well, what is it that these things do so when we're trying to innovate what are the things around us what do they actually do what am i what's my value proposition really and then how can I deliver that better? So I'm, I'm not interested in the answer phone, I'm interested in the message being saved. Nowadays, I mean, the phone, you know, we, we have our phones. When was the last time you phoned anybody? <laughs> it's it's, it's uh, the value proposition has changed. What is good about a phone? Oh, it provides me access to news, TV, messaging and you know to a certain extent knowledge and frank kenner's work there you know what the fundamental what is fundamentally good uh you know it's a big question what is good what is it to be good um and good is either perceptual is it you know is it perceived does something have to be perceived to be good or can it be inherently good can something just be good that's a great philosophical question. And it goes all the way back to, you know, Plato, Socrates arguing about or, or proclaiming that some things are inherently good, intrinsically good, and some things allow you to access things that are intrinsically good. So, and also some things can be both. Great. Uh, George Moore is saying that no, actually good is always perceptual. Things are good only in if they're perceived to be good. Um, but when you sort of look over time and people have done this, and that's part of Frank Kenner's work, is things that seem to be good, like the aesthetic, 
you don't specify what is aesthetically pleasing because that changes but things being nice to look at is always perceived to be good over time what those things are changes but the perception that aesthetic is a good thing that truth is a good thing I'm not sure i would say maybe true true sometimes ooh, can be a difficult thing can be in a lot of trouble not always good but good for who um knowledge is seen to be good um so are these core truths uh are these core values are they are they inherently good uh, those are really interesting questions not sure where i was going with that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no it is it is fascinating and staying in the fascinating thread you were asked to bring one object to the interview that might be meaningful for our discussion today. Would you please share what your object is and why you brought it? I think we failed to bring an object. That's all right. I can edit that out. Because <laughs> I forgot about the object. Professor Glenn Perry, after this robust and fascinating conversation, people will no doubt want to learn more about you, your research, and the future direction of travel for everything you're researching. So can you please share how people can learn more about you? Gosh. Um, well, I have a YouTube channel, um, which this may or may not appear on. Um, a good professor is the so Monica, but if you look at Glenn Parry, hopefully you'll find me in loads of videos. I can uh, link it in the show notes as well. Okay, yeah. So I share a lot of uh, academic content and ideas on there. Um, we try and summarize papers. There's an awful lot of strategy and supply chain and current work. We make little films because I think it's quite digestible. And then we link to papers, the academic papers. Again, it's that level of, you know, you'll understand something on the level of YouTube, but read the paper. <laughs> <laughs> that's just my interpretation of my colleague, David. We've made loads of videos. But yeah, that's our interpretation of something. But obviously, if you read, again, Gadama says we read with purpose. When we read, we read with intent for us to get something out of it. That colors the way we view the world. Um, but yeah, so I've got that. I've got LinkedIn, uh, email, Twitter. You know, I am a professor of digital transformation. I have an awfully big digital footprint online. So I always say when people say, oh, how do I find you? I say, well, I'm online. And if you can't find me, it's a you problem, not a me problem. <laughs> I'm just there. I, I'm old enough that I was, I was, you know, around since the birth of the internet. <laughs> you know, I got through my undergraduate without email. <laughs> so back in your day, the internet was delivered to you? It was mailed to you? You found it in libraries? Uh, when I started, there wasn't an internet. <laughs> Yeah, it was back in the libraries and microfiche. I'm not, you know, I'm not even that old. <laughs> Take notes, kids. There's something to be learned from those who persevered without internet. Yeah, but well, it, is, it is very useful. Indeed. Professor Glenn Perry, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today for the podcast. And we really appreciate your time. No, thank you so much. Hopefully my vague meanderings have been mildly amusing to whoever has listened this far nuggets nuggets of information and joy left all along the trail thank you for that 